few wars of antiquity could compare with the colossal First Punic War. For 23 years, the two most powerful states in the Western Mediterranean smashed their armies against one another in a gruelling test for supremacy. Over the course of these two decades, perhaps as many as one million men were killed in the fighting, with 100,000 dying in a single storm. It featured possibly the largest naval battle in history, and saw the threat of fate span in the direction of full Roman domination in and around the Mediterranean Sea. Before we can speak of massive battles and inventive strategies, I will lay out the state of the Western Mediterranean in the decades leading up to the initiation of conflict, with Carthage's growing dom dominion of the Mediterranean, and Rome's rapid rise to power in Italy. I will start with Rome. According to the official Roman myths, Rome was founded in 753 BC by the eponymous Romulus after he called Rith and ultimately killed his younger brother Remus. Rome was initially founded as an elective kingdom. For those seeking more knowledge about Rome's founding legend, I recommend Historia Civilis' video on the topic. While the stories of Romulus and Remus are more than likely fiction, archaeological evidence does seem to corroborate the very rough chronology, with estimates of habitation ranging in the early 1st millennium BC. Situated among seven hills, Rome held a strong defensive position while also sitting atop the important north-south trade routes between Etruria to the north and Magna Graecia, literally Greater Greece, to the south. The kingdom would last until 509 BC, when the final Roman king Tarquinius Superbus was driven from the city and a republic was declared where no man, regardless of rank, would hold absolute authority. It should be noted that Athenian democracy was established in 508, so this date should be taken with some Carthaginian salt. While expansion was slow at first, Rome would begin to establish itself as a regional power by the dawn of the 4th century, but events conspired to put an end to the young republic. A Gallic tribe called the Senones crossed into Italy and eventually found themselves at war with Rome. After a victory in 388, the Gauls attacked Rome and breached the city in 386, burning everything to the ground and forcing a humiliating peace in which the Romans paid them to finally leave. The Romans had emerged from the conflict alive but by the skin of their teeth, and the experience had left them traumatised. Never again would Rome fall to foreign invaders, and they held their word admirably. Rome would not fall again for 800 years. Following on from this, Roman expansion sped up quickly, and by 280 all of Italy excepting Magna Graecia was under their control, although the state of affairs would quickly change. The Greek city of Tarentum asked Pyrrhus to save them from Roman dominion. Seeing a good opportunity to expand his own power, the Epirote king gladly accepted and fought the Republic for five years. After three hard-fought battles and a failed expedition to Sicily, Pyrrhus saw the impossibility of the war and left for home. With no one to turn to, Tarentum fell in 272, and soon all of Greater Greece was fell. For the first time in its history, Italy was unified and under one banner. And this is where we will leave the Romans for now. Carthage, according to legend, was founded in 814 BC by Queen Dido, who was in flight from the great Phoenician city of Tyre after her husband was killed by her brother. The word Punic comes, from, comes down from the Latin word ponis, meaning Phoenicia. After landing, the local Libyans mocked her by saying she could have as much land as an oxide could cover. But much to their dismay, she was able to secure substantial territory by cutting the hide into thin strips and laying them along the ground. Much like the Romulan legend, the story is probably fictitious, but it does support the broader strokes of early Carthaginian history. Earliest evidence of human habitation points to the late 9th century, so the chronology holds up and it was founded by Tyre, the greatest trading city of its age. Despite Carthage not being the oldest Phoenician colony in Africa, it would eventually come to outstrip its neighbours in both size and majesty. Initially forced to pay tribute to the local rulers, Carthage would slowly grow. Inheriting the good sense for trade from their mother city, the Carthaginians were renowned traders and their ships could be seen from Spain to Egypt. With the decline of Tyre in the 6th century, Carthage became a de facto independent and soon began to spawn colonies of its own. In order to grow this empire, Carthage would fight many wars against the Greeks of Sicily, tensions which would play a large part in the Punic Wars. So by 265 BC, Carthage had come to rule a vast empire which held sway over much of the North African coast, Sicily, Sardinia and the Balearics, with further land being held in Hispania and most of Sicily. Although most of the heavy lifting was done by Carthage in Rome, there was another state worth mentioning, Syracuse. Founded as a Corinthian colony, Syracuse benefited greatly from the fertile lands of Sicily and quickly became prosperous. Being a strong and wealthy city, its rulers soon looked further afield for territory and attempted to assert their dominion over all Sicily, much to the dismay of Carthage. The Sicilian wars went back and forth over 300 years, with the Syracusans landing an army in Africa attempted unsuccessfully to, and, it, and attempted unsuccessfully to cut the head off the serpent. By the time of the first Punic Wars rolled around, Carthage had conquered most of Sicily with the exception of the east coast, 
The remaining Greeks in Syracuse would prove a painful thorn in the Punic side during the wars. Not being the greatest of warriors, the Carthaginians used their own citizens sparingly when raising armies, being unable to quickly replenish these losses and, rep um, and relied on foreign divisions of troops for their armies. But the idea of a Carthaginian mercenary army is not exactly true. For most of its history, the Libyans which populated its North African territories provided much of the manpower for its armies. This came in a few forms. Libyan spearmen equipped with linen armour and oval shields, and some shot cavalry. Other allied kingdoms in Africa, like Numidia, also provided troops for Punic armies, with the most notable being the famous Numidian cavalry, skirmishing cavalry which had lightning-fast horses, enabling them to rain javelins upon their foes before retreating to safety. Across the pond, Hispanic heavy troops which had a large shield and were armed with a throwing spear and a thrusting sword which would eventually become the model for the Roman gladius. Another sword, the falcata, was used for slashing and was also popular among Hispanic troops. Troops could be pulled in from the Gauls, who could provide both infantry and cavalry. These were generally more lightly armoured. All this resulted in a polyethnic army composed of thousands of men who could not even speak to their comrades. Though it should be noted that contingents composed of a single nationality were not common, and the armies were usually quite mixed. Sadly, the lack of indigenous information on the structure of these armies will forever leave the more specific structures shrouded in mystery with later Roman and or Greek writers offering little in this regard, or being unclear. Men were raised through allied cities or kingdoms, or from larger states, or as mercenaries, which the Carthaginians, regularly having more gold than they knew what to do with, could raise in large numbers. In sharp contrast with the patchwork polyethnic army, the navy of Carthage was manned almost entirely by citizens, offering a good escape route for the poorer citizens of the city. While it was smaller during times of peace, Carthage probably had a permanent navy in order to protect the trade routes which had made them so hide hideously wealthy. A testament to the naval power of the city is the gargantuan circular harbour which still exists in ruins, having the capacity for as many as 180 ships. The Roman military was never static. Over the years, Rome's methods for crushing its enemies into the ground changed significantly, always adapted to their situation and not above adopting superior foreign techniques, as we shall see over the course of the First Punic War. The army had transformed from a Greek-style phalanx formation with hoplites to, a new, to the new and unique manipular legion. Each legion consisted of three main forces, which were organised into three lines during battle. The first of these was the Hastati, the youngest and least experienced men in the legion, followed by the Principes, men around 30 years old, and finally the Triarii, the oldest and most experienced men in the, of the legion. Below these lines were the Maniples. Each line was composed of 10, and a Maniple housed 120 men. It should be noted that the Maniples of the Triarii were 60 men strong. Each Maniple was divided into two centuries. These centuries did not fight separately, and usually, and usually the centurion on the right was in charge. Because Roman soldiers were required to pay for all their equipment, if a man was not yet old or affluent enough to join the ranks of the heavy infantry, then he was inducted into the ranks of the velites, a lightly, lightly armed men equipped with javelins who supported the main body by raining javelins upon their opponents before retreating back. The Romans had no navy at this time, so I'll be talking about that later. In the next episode, we will take a look at the cause for war between the two powers and the opening salvos of the First Punic War. I hope you like this video, although I don't have any views at the moment, so, um, yeah. Okay, bye.